Ollie Hicks, good to see you. Now, we're going to jump straight in. It strikes me that the one common thread that that connects all of your endeavors, past and and present, is the ocean. Where does that come from? I love for messing around on boats. Yeah, good starting point for anything. Well, I can't really remember much before I was seven, and you struggle to remember what are real memories and what are just memories that she rejigged from photographs. But I have got a photograph of when I was seven, I got a little yellow kayak for my seventh birthday, and I remember forcing my parents to take that wherever we went, so whether that was to the canal in London, London, you know, on the sea in Suffolk, or we had an eccentric a friend who lived on an island in Essex. I was obsessed with being in, on, or under the water in any way, shape, or form from from seven, and that seems to be an affliction that's never left. I've always been quite conflicted about audiobooks, but this is the first one that has blown me away. So this is Werner Herzog's new book, and every man for himself and God against all, and it and it's read and narrated by him. So so like as an aside, epic. I mean, he he said not in his book, but he said a while ago, what would an ocean be without a monster lurking in the dark? So what what have been the hardest moments you've you've faced at sea? The good thing about how I choose to travel at sea is generally it's very slow. You drag sledges and I drag boats essentially, and you know. One of the, I think, quite beautiful things about that slow travel is you're going slower than almost anything else in the ocean. You're going slower than the flipping plankton most of the time, if not backwards. So you are privileged to witness some of these extraordinary things, which are actually quite hard to describe. Just these incredible sort of displays of, you know, people think plankton is boring. I mean, this bioluminescent phytoplankton you get under the boat at night, it's like it's like a nightclub or a disco of lights going on under the boat. And I would try and take photographs of that, but forget get it you know it doesn't come out but it's like being in this 3d floating disco where it's so dark that you can't differentiate between the sky and the sea and you're in this black orb with disco lights all around you i mean you know you're gonna start saying i've taken too many substances at at this point but this is entirely natural not driven by fatigue so i think there's a sense of wonder for me more than a sense of fear being on the ocean actually until i went down to the southern ocean alone in a rowing boat i'd never really been frightened at sea and it's frightening down there because there's this sense of isolation is like nothing else seen anywhere else for 96 days i didn't see another boat plane any sign of life not even a piece of rubbish not even a single sign of pollution down there which i suppose is a good thing but very very isolating and like falling off the face of the earth and just the you know it's the roaring 40s and the furious 50s and what they said was below the 40s there is no law and below the 50s there is no god and those sentiments you can understand why that's what they felt the power of the elements and the ever-growing waves and the only thing that's down there is wind waves and albatross so yeah being set a amongst those incredibly powerful elements in a tiny boat and being pretty small is about as intense as it gets. And I would say seaweed farming in an environment that doesn't really exist yet in the most offshore setting in Europe is up there with marine challenges, <laughs> for sure. Something that I've found a sort of perennial challenge is trying to put the experiences that you and I have had. My first big solo trip was was on the Arctic Ocean, which was at least semi-frozen. So I was I was we both done stuff on the surface of oceans. I was dragging a sledge over it. You were rowing a boat. But we both did big trips on our own in our sort of younger and, and more formative years. I've always found that my vocabulary feels feels stunted. Like the, the words that I have at my disposal just don't don't do it justice. So have you have you found the same struggle in that you spent many weeks of your life doing something that 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 probably n- no one else will ever fully understand, and, and therefore no one other than you will ever know what it was like. That's a fascinating point to discuss because I think that's the nature of of solo travel is you do experience these extraordinary experiences through sight, sound, hardship, privation, elation. There's only so long you can bore people about your holiday, you know, tales for. And of course, they it doesn't really resonate with them on any sort of any comparable level to that which it does for you, of course. And, you know, I always liken it a little bit to soldiers who've been away at war in action, and then they come back and no one can relate to what they've done or been through or seen. But they do have this incredible campaign camaraderie within their within their sort of tight-knit groups and I've always looked at that with a sort of slightly tinge of envy because I think on solo expeditioning that's not part of the big deal no Mm. you will never be able to describe that those feelings that you went through. I only read this recently. Now it turns it turns out in, in psychology there is something called the that psychologists call the overview effect, which is I've seen it applied to astronauts who've had this extraordinary, very unnatural shift in perspective. They, they've they've seen planet Earth, you know, from a distance, which I'm not sure we ever really evolved to do. And and you hear this in the way that Chris Hadfield recently said the world is tough, but life and civilization from the perspective he'd seen it were 
fragile. That's how you describe them. How, how have your, now clearly you haven't been in space, but you've, you've, you've kind of been close in many ways, at least psychologically. How have your expeditions changed the way you see the, the planet? I mean, funnily enough, I, when I was on the trying to row around Antarctica or around the bottom of the world, the sponsor said we had to call it. And so on this global row, I did have a call with the space station because the astronauts in the space station are allowed a sort of R and R call with whoever they want. And God knows why, but this astronaut who was called Bob chose to call me. And many times he said on that journey, I would have been the closest person to, to them and vice versa. I think the overwhelming sense is how small and insignificant we really are. What I long for, and I hope we can make some small inroad into, is improving the abundance of the marine environment. And when you go and see an incredibly healthy marine environment, you know, like I would put Iceland in this bracket where if you go dive or some of the Norwegian coastline that I've been to where you go diving and there's just, you know, fish like if you I mean, if you read any books about the sort of Grand Banks, the, the, the halcyon days of the fisheries on the Grand Banks where, you know, they talk about the cod were like jumping into their dories, just the abundance of biomass on the planet back then. And can we ever get back to that sort of level of, you know, wildlife richness? Um, why really people go to Africa, isn't it, to be blown away by the sort of incredible mm. herds of plains game in the Serengeti and, and so on. And I think that that is one area that I think we can really work towards by building these ocean rainforests or blue forests of kelp to act as that species haven, a sort of nursery for regenerating these species and some of that richness and abundance. And you see some of that purity of environment and richness of wildlife, totally untainted by humanity when you're in those far, far out to sea, out of sight of land. We've lost so much of that. It's rare to be blown away by that just abundance of, of biomass. And it's so remarkable when you see it. And, and I just hope we can bring that back. And, you know, selfishly, I would love for my children to be able to go, I mean, if you go fishing now in the UK, yeah, it's about the most depressing thing you can do because it's absolutely fishing, not catching. Can we bring back that abundance of fisheries? Because I love for my children to go, to be able to go fishing and catch a bucket full of mackerel or whatever it is, just those simple pleasures um, that are actually now quite hard to come by. You are a co-founder now, but how do you, how have your solo rows shaped your approach to, to working now within a team? But for now, expeditions are on the back burner. We need to, a more reliable way of paying the mortgage and funding these children to rear these children. And so, yeah, I've taken the sensible step of, of setting up an offshore mariculture business and much more secure line of work. Um, so quite three years ago, we set up Alga Pelago, which is currently the largest licensed offshore kelp farm in Europe. And so we set out initially to grow kelp and really sell it to the highest bidder. We're having to refine that strategy a little bit and turn our kelp into agricultural products. And we're also looking to broaden out into what we call regenerative ocean farming. So looking at the farming of shellfish and kelp all in a, a sort of closed loop cycle for the benefit of the environment, as well as creating viable economic products. I think that there's many similarities with the journey between, I suppose, it's entrepreneurship and leading expeditions, but both in teams or solo expeditions. But I think the real word I would use to encapsulate the whole lot is it's pioneering across both fields you are trying to do something that's been done by very few people you're trying to persuade people to part with their hard-earned cash to support what you're doing and whether that's in return for what used to be column inches in, in terms of publicity or um, you know through our aquaculture endeavors through increasingly valuable shares when your starting proposition seems somewhat outlandish or extraordinary it's you know you, you're sort of at the same baseline in terms of a challenging starting point so there's enormous similarity and, and you've got to build the enthusiasm the appetite to people for people to come with you on that journey it may or may not be sort of in the boat as it were but You've got to get the boat to the start line. You know, we've got to build a base of funds to get our farm in the water, to buy boats, to build our factory. So, you know, the, the building blocks are similar and the challenge in approaching investors, be they sponsors or shareholders, are really are really similar in terms of convincing them that you're going to pull off this extraordinary feat. Um, mm. And I think that the solo part, I suppose the, the isolation, again, is quite similar in terms of if you're leading any project, you know, the role of a leader is quite isolating because um, certainly you can lean on your wider team, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. And, and clearly, Ollie, you're not one to take the path of least resistance. Your previous career and, and being a founder now, they're both tough paths to follow. Why not get a sensible day job? Why seek out a challenge? Where's this, where's this come from, do you think? <laughs> 
Well, I ask myself that question most <laughs> days, Ben, and I have not answered it yet. But I often think, wouldn't life have been so much easier if I'd just gone on to the Goldman Sachs program when I was 20? But cool, wouldn't have that have been quite boring? I think I, um, you know, I probably am a terrible sufferer of ADHD. And there are many things that ADHD gives you, uh, as I have limited understanding of it. But one of the things I think it does give you is this extraordinary level of hyper focus. But you only get that hyper focus when you're interested in something. So if I am not, if I'm not captivated by something then i'm never going to do well at it um so i think you know i was captivated by marine expeditions and extraordinary voyages in small boats perhaps as you were by the polar the sort of heroic age of polar exploration since i was 12 and you know i devoured obsessively anything i could find on the subject and i would say that offshore marry culture this sort of slight niche that's developing in terms of a sustainable way of growing food in an offshore environment has really captured my imagination in the same way because it's 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 pioneering it's a cutting edge there's not very many people doing it there's an absolute band of sort of desperados looking at it forging the way making mistakes figuring out what works what doesn't work and you know i think that is an exciting interesting place to be from a intellectual challenge from a sort of problem solving and a, and a can we do it i think it's nice having that jeopardy in your in your life well on an intellectual level that's nice on a day to day basis it's less good and my wife would certainly like to do without the jeopardy but you know, <laughs> I, think. I, I feel your pain on many fronts. <laughs> I'm keen to dig into specific learnings or insights from that you might have taken from, from ocean rowing into being a founder of a startup. The overwhelming lesson that I would say is, has been helpful is that development of a, what do you want to call it, a thick skin or grit or resilience, because you, know, you start with an A to B journey, right? Whether you're going to row from New York to England, it's A to B. So if you boil it down to its bare bones, that's all you've got to do. You've got to row as long as you can. Maybe you can row 12 hours a day and you'll sleep the other 12. And it's quite a simple plan, right? But you know, the minutiae and the intricacies of real life will, will interfere with that. And I think we on the, on the startup side of life, we have a similar plan, which is to become Europe's go-to offshore marriage culture developer. So when Equinor want to build a new wind farm in the Celtic Sea, come to us and we will help them have within that a, a marriage culture operation in amongst the turbines. So in simple terms, it's quite a straightforward story, but it's at a really basic level. You know, when you've had five investors slam the door in your face for the, for the fifth day in a row, and you've got to get up and tell the story again the next day, when your confidence is through the floor and you're exactly what wondering why didn't I go to Goldman Sachs when I was 21 and how do I keep going? I think that is a resilience that, that is only built over time and hard won experience that you know that you just have to knock on another five doors because it might be the 59th door that opens. Mm. And the only thing which will ultimately defeat you is if you stop knocking on the doors. So I think it's that blend of resilience and bloody mindedness. What's your advice to people wanting to build their own resilience without buying a rowing boat and crossing the Atlantic on their own? I've often tried to distill this into a formula. I mean, everyone has a level of resilience within themselves, but it's how do you bolster or build that? I'm not sure because I, I don't think it's a, a fixed quotient of resilience or mental toughness you have. In any given month, you might have three days where you feel weak as a church mouse and any form of sort of confidence crushing rejection from investors or suppliers or technical advisors, you know, can send you running for the hills. You have to go home and lick your wounds. Maybe a better way of looking at it is sort of management or knowledge of self and you know when you're in, in a team when we did a, a kayak journey from Greenland to Scotland we spent quite a lot of time doing a psychological analysis of what were the strengths and weaknesses of one another and understanding mm. one another's strengths and weaknesses was incredibly helpful in terms of how we would treat each other on the journey you know what triggered the other person to be gloomy or depressed or encouraged and I think having a knowledge of self around that and knowing when you are feeling low is probably not a good time to be going into a pitch or it okay, may, may be unavoidable but you know what's going to buoy you up and what's going to knock you flat and so I think that just that sort of management of self which yeah I guess through my experience has come through expeditions and if you manage yourself well and on a really basic almost kit husbandry and keeping your kit dry so that even if you've had a lousy day and you've been in the rain all day you've got a nice warm sleeping bag to crawl into at the end of the day and if you liken that into the startup world if you've had five knockbacks but then you've got a couple of easy win calls where a sympathetic ear or another startup pal who's going through the same mincing machine being able to have that maturity experience vulnerability and I mean, sharing that experience you know and 
hopefully, and the trouble with the startup world is you often don't have a big team around you. Mm. But if the team can support you, bolster you, albeit you may be in a leadership position and everyone's like, it's up to you. I think I read a while ago, you talked about to enjoy rather than endure. You are enduring a challenging journey of sorts at the moment. I would say we are in that old school mentality. We are hustling and grinding and I would say when it comes to climate, our outlook on the climate is we're quite objective that what we are doing needs to work economically before it can have any chance of working environmentally. Mm. So the climate benefits or the environmental benefits of what we're doing are almost secondary to the commercial reality, because what, what we realize is it will never it will never be sustainable on an economic standpoint unless it works commercially. And that is all about, for us, speaking of quite a lot of hustle and grind and showing people this is an investable proposition. I'm impatient. I want to do operations. I hate the detail. I hate bureaucracy. So we try and build a team where there is someone who can pick up the bits that everyone else is bad at. We're imperfect in that respect, like everyone else, but um, we, we're getting there. And what we're longing to do is, is close our first round and have that freedom them to operate and demonstrate that what we're talking about does work it does work at scale it works economically and it's beneficial for the environment and i don't know just the way i'm wired and the way i think is i can see in my i can visualize how it's going to work i find that quite straightforward but articulating that every day telling you know telling your holiday story every day is wearing <laughs> and there's been some criticism about what is exploration what does that what does that mean in the 21st century? there's this wonderful sir david anifred line no one protects what they don't care about and no one cares about what they've never experienced how do we engender a, a sense of stewardship about the natural world to people that aren't going to see antarctica or the arctic ocean or indeed the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. People won't protect what they haven't experienced. I, get, I take that point to, to a degree, but I think in terms of the pure wonder of things, well, David Attenborough's done that for us in many respects. None of us could fit into a lifetime, except maybe David Attenborough, but what he's done and, and what he's seen and what he's brought into so many millions of homes through those programs. I think people do have a sense of what's out there and we can't all expect to experience all those things firsthand. I think you would probably say that, and I would say the same, that there's swathes and swathes of millions of square miles of ocean when incredibly boring and i wouldn't recommend people to go and see it and isn't don't people sort of describe the uh you know the center of the uh southern ice plateau as like being inside a golf ball or a ping pong ball I remember years ago a conversation with um <laughs> one of the team at, at uh, ale i was about to fly into antarctica and steve jones i think you might know steve yeah. and, and we were talking about maps and he said, he said, you might as well have a blank piece of A3 paper, just a bit of white paper. Like, That'll do. So I think people get the wonder and then the sort of majesty of all those places. But can mm. we bring it closer to home? We have such a rich isle here, and yet the UK has the worst biodiversity rating in Europe. You know, we've got to be able to fix that. It's not, it's not rocket science. But I also think that people are not going to change that their ways of living, their habitats, their, their habits, their lifestyle, for something that's not better. You can't expect people to start mm. living in wearing a hair shirt or stop they're doing their flights or whatever they are so we've got to find better ways of doing things and i also don't think it's, it's on a to b journey you know i think a lot of people are looking at this oh let, let's look at this carbon dioxide removal it's a big factory and it's going to suck out all the well it's got to be a stepped approach and we've got to make the these baby steps is, is how we see it and, and it's just getting better by degrees and i know the clock is ticking but our approach on our ocean farming is well can, can we farm at a level that's better than the status quo and over time we'd like to you know work towards a standard which is better and better so that we're not using plastic ropes or we're not using diesel in our boats but it's all a, a stepped approach by what's achievable and practicable because i think if you try to get from a to b in a one it, it's, it's just it just won't work so i think it's mm. got to be that sort of phased approach that people can adjust their habits over time and in terms of today's exploration you know well maybe we maybe you and i have pivoted from dragging sledges or rowing boats because we're too old and old and fat speak for yourself <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it is actually the um the new sort of pioneering space you know it's it's certainly intellectually more more challenging i think it's it's probably equally challenging on a project development or project management standpoint hopefully it's a bit more lucrative and it remains to be seen but no i, I agree with you i never liked or tried to adopt the moniker of explorer nor really adventurer last question fun one if you had a billion quid to spend on fixing the climate the environment with no red tape how would you how would you spend it and if it's put it into your startup then then what does the future of ocean farming look like in, in 10 years' time? Going back to my point around step-by-step -step improvement and getting you know towards climate change solutions, I think where we see regenerative aquaculture fitting into that is I don't particularly...
basically by the carbon sequestration, long-term carbon sequestration by kelp at massive scale. The sort of scales and the science just don't really stack up. But in terms of biodiversity uplift um, and net gain on that front, I think it can be incredibly powerful. In terms of other nutrient uplift, it can be great. In terms of displacement of other carbon-intensive project products, that's where seaweed is a really exciting story. But what we're really focused on is this sort of broader regenerative aquaculture where you're um, growing multiple species in a closed loop farming system whereby your waste of one species becomes the nutrients for another. And so creating those creating those sustainable farming systems, I mean, much like they're doing a regenerative agriculture on land, the investment community and the aquaculture community are starting to wake up and look at this as an aquaculture solution as well. So I think it ticks a lot of boxes. And if you want to see it through the lens of the SDGs, it ticks so many of those boxes in terms of food security, jobs in deprived areas and as well as climate change or environmental solutions. So it's not the silver bullet, but a billion dollars will help to develop that out a bit. Ollie, thank you. It's been a pleasure to hear your story, especially this this new chapter. I will be cheering on your new endeavor at uh, Algapelago from the from the sideline. I'd love to come down and get on a boat at some point soon, so hopefully we can we can make that happen. But thank you for joining us on on New Frontiers. Thank you for having me, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on New Frontiers. For more stories and insights, you can visit my website, bensaunders.com. And please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. I want to leave you with a thought from Norwegian explorer Fridjof Nansen, who wrote this in 1928. It is a difficult time you are living in, no doubt. And the world does not give you a bright outlook just now, perhaps. But... It is an interesting 